A Dangerous Method is the film, uh, Mr. Cronenberg's latest. It stars Viggo Mortensen, Michael Fassbender, Keira Knightley. It's about the relationship between Freud and Jung in the earliest days of psychoanalysis and the woman that comes between them. It opens, uh, when does it open, Limited? It opens November 23rd, this Wednesday, Limited. Wednesday. And I think it wow. starts in the middle, beginning or middle of December, it will expand. It's crowded uh, holiday season, man. Oh, it's a very crowded holiday season. But I wonder if it, is it going to be Good a lot stuff. of limited, a lot of limited releases, and then in January, you're going to have yeah. thing because you have a lot of big, just big movies coming out in January, just not Oscar related, but just they're they're throwing everything in January this year. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be very crowded uh, for two, in the next few months. <laughs> but this is uh, getting rave reviews. It's a great, great film, great performances of Viggo Mortensen particularly that we haven't seen before. He plays Freud. It's a fascinating performance from him. Uh, we talked to Mr. Cronenberg about what drew him to the movie, uh, some other aspects of the film, his relationship with Howard Shore, his longtime composer. Part of the reason why you make a movie is to figure out why you were drawn to make that movie to begin with. That's so right. having reached the end of this journey, uh, what do you know about those motivations that you didn't know when you first embarked on it? Sure, of course. It might not be the end yet. <laughs> it might not be at the end of the journey yet, but um, because it's in truth, weirdly enough, it's when you do interviews about your movie that you start to have to articulate these things because normally you maybe would not bother to or try to um, articulate them. So um, I think um, my, I have a friend who reminded me that the first movie, the first film I ever made. Uh, was a seven-minute short called Transfer, and it was about a psychiatrist and his patient. So obviously this relationship that was new with Freud, that Freud invented, the relationship between an analyst and his patient, uh, was a fascinating one to me, a sort of strange, interesting one, an invented relationship that doesn't come sort of naturally, let's say, out of the family or anything else. It's a kind of an intellectually constructed relationship. Um, you have someone going to a complete stranger and then being asked to be incredibly articulate about the most intimate kind of things. And then you have the phenomenon of transference um, where the, the patient starts to project onto the analyst emotions and relationships that he or she has with people in her life. And and and, and then that gets kind of complicated. <laughs> so it's, this is a very intriguing as I say, new relationship that had never existed before and then evolved in many ways as various splinter groups uh, from Freud's psychoanalytic uh, group um, developed their own versions of, of of that relationship and so on and so on. Um, but anyway, uh, so I think... I think in, in essence that was that's really what was intriguing me about uh, about psychoanalysis and then when you add to that the the charisma and the passion and the in, in intellect of all of the characters in this movie which is kind of an unusual thing um, their their ideas were never just abstractions for them they were really passionate um, um, obsessions that that they felt could alter lives and, and for the better, and that they and they tried to embed these things into the way they lived their lives, and that, that too dramatically is very intriguing. What you see in his work and what he represents does that inform your creative sensibilities in any way? Well, first of all, Freud was uh, a, a, a wonderful writer. And in fact, at a certain point, he was being considered for the Nobel Prize, and they weren't sure whether they should give it to him for literature or for science. And that just lets mm. you know uh, where he where he was with his talent. It, it considered some of the most beautiful German ever written. Um, but I think anybody growing up in the 20th century, being formed in the late 20th century, will have been influenced by Freud, whether he knows it or not. You know, the, 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 just our understanding of human psychology of the human condition. So much of that comes from Freud, even when we're not aware of it. It's really, it's sort of in the air you breathe, you know, part of the zeitgeist. And uh, um, so I will have been influenced by Freud in that sense. There are artists like Bernardo Bertolucci, for example, who says that he actually used psycho, uses psychoanalytic method in, in structuring his movies. And, and, of course, the surrealists, Salvador Dali and so on, really use Freud's dream interpretation techniques as part
part of their their sort of tools of of their art. Uh, I don't go that far, you know. It's not it's not conscious. Let's put it that way. That's a good Freudian term. It would be a subconscious or unconscious. You mentioned the, the in your first answer about the relationship between the the, the psychiatrist and the and the patient, in that the, the patient comes in and they have to be uh, completely open. I'm thinking about the brave performances that that show up in your films time and time again, and, and Kira Knightley in this film. It's an incredibly brave, bold performance, and I think of movies like Crash. And, and for you as a filmmaker, what do you do to create an environment that's conducive to, to giving that actor that amount of freedom to, to, to give that kind of performance? Right. Well, I think it's two things. It's a combination of excitement and safety. Um, it's, it's a challenge. It's, it, you know, it'll be a role in a movie that is a challenge to an actor, something that he maybe or she has never played before. But then the safety of, of me, my attitude to acting, and the way that I run the set, the film set, gives the actor the feeling that, that he can do, um, try things, and will you know, make mistakes, be extreme, pull back, um, suggest things, and never, never be punished or humiliated or anything like that, as long as it's a real collaboration and it's not sort of a, a, a neurotic thing and I must say I, I really haven't run into that um, mm -hmm. uh, then then it's it's a wonderful uh, safe creative collaboration and I mean even to the extent that you know I have monitors everywhere in the set and actors can are totally free to look at them if they want to you know this is some directors who are very possessive of the monitor and the image and they don't really want to share it um, I don't feel that way I feel that it's for the whole crew to 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 be involved in the film in, in minute detail. And that goes for the actors as well. So it, it's that it's that combination. Well, and you have in, in this film, there's this delicious, very kind of stimulating and fascinating menage a trois going on. And it's not all sexual among all three, of course. Yeah. But uh, how essential was it to to kind of establish relationships between those actors before you started shooting? Mm -hmm. Totally not important. <laughs> Actually, well, in the sense that the realities of movie making, especially if you're working with stars of any magnitude, is that you don't have access to them very often. Um, I long ago discovered that I hate rehearsals and I find them completely useless because I find that once you get on the set, you know, rehearsals in the sort of stage style where everybody sits around a table and they all read the script to each other and make comments and so on uh, I found that to be not very productive for me um, so I don't rehearse with the actors and therefore I don't even hear I've never heard the lines of dialogue actually spoken until we're actually shooting the movie you know we're, we're, we're at least blocking the scene you call it blocking the scene but it's not really rehearsing it's sort of working out how, how people will move through a room for example wh where they will say their lines and what they will do um, and uh, and I like that, and I like the spontaneity of that, and the danger of that, because I'm not prepped. I don't do storyboards. I just, you know, we just go on the set, and we start to feel the scene. Um, now, people talk about chemistry, you know, between actors a lot, and it is a it is an interesting and intriguing thing, and a necessary thing. But how do do you, as a director? know that your actors will have chemistry. For example, Michael Fassbender and Kira Knightley. Uh, I've never seen them in the movie together, in, in a movie together, because they've never done one together. Um, they don't know each other. Um, I only talk to them separately. Until I actually see them in the room together doing the scene, I don't know what the chemistry is going to be between them. So it, it's you have... There's no rules. There's no guidebook for you as a director. You know, this kind of casting element is an extremely important uh, mm -hmm. part of directing, but it's kind of invisible. Nobody really thinks much about it. But in fact, casting is, is very tricky. And, uh, you know, it can, you can kill your movie by miscasting it before you've shot a photo film. Yeah. And, but to hear you describe it, I know a lot of filmmakers, and, and a lot of filmmakers do this out of budgetary concerns, I'm sure, but they tend to make their movie before they even make their movie. Uh, it's, but but y y your approach it allows you to be a lot more instinctual on set. 
Yeah, well, but but you see, at the same time, I've really simplified the way I shoot movies now, and we actually came in way under schedule on on Dangerous Method, um, mm-hmm. even though I shot everything that I felt I needed to shoot. So, with with maturity, with experience, you can be incredibly efficient, and also, I mean, I'm sure you feel it, but the the movie has the feeling of great control. You know, it has a feeling that everything is where it should be, and that it was very well thought out. And of course, you do a lot of prep, uh, even given the way I'm talking about the way I shoot. You know, you you've you've cast the movie, you've found the locations, you've built the sets, you've you've designed the costumes. Um, and and you've played with the props and you've you've figured out which cigar Ford will smoke and how and when and how you know all of that stuff. So when when I come to the set with the actors, it's not that it's not as though we we have no idea what's going on, but we haven't really figured out what lens we're going to use, how we're going to light it, how I'm going to cover the scene, and, or how the actors will block the scene, how they'll move through the scene, and that's really where the actors contribute a huge amount. Uh, yeah. is if you do storyboards, for example, w- 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 which are usually done before you've even cast the movie, then you, you're moving the actors around like pawns, sort of to match what you did on your storyboards. Uh, in other words, you're sort of making like a comic book version of your movie. To me, that really is cutting out the collaboration of a lot of people, uh, and I, I, especially your actors. And I think, why would I cast incredibly wonderful creative actors and then not let them have input into how how they you know how they act the scene that that's the way it exactly anyway. yeah yeah you know you'd mentioned chemistry and w- one of the great examples of chemistry in your own career it, it has been between yourself and Howard Shore yeah and and we had the pleasure of speaking to Mr. Shore uh and, and I'm wondering from you how do you define what makes that relationship work well, music is a mysterious thing because it's really beyond articulation. It's beyond language. You know that's why it's so intriguing and why it has such vis- visceral and emotional and sort of time binding uh, elements. That will, by by which I mean, you know, if you hear a, a song, let's say that that's from your youth, it kind of brings back incredible floods of emotion and feelings that you had at the time. You know, when you first discover that song and yet there's no, it's very difficult to talk about that kind of thing um and so with a, with with a composer that you're working with as a director it's really great if you have just the kind of visceral you know Howard and I if you heard us talk we, it would be so abstract you wouldn't really know what we were talking about I don't think and yet we do know what we're talking about, and we don't have to talk a lot, you know. It's just, and it's an understanding too. I mean, we we both come from Toronto. We both knew each other when we were kids there, um, so we have very similar. We have reference points that are mutual, and so on. And uh, and we started our careers really uh, in movies together, basically. Um, mm-hmm. The Brood was one of the was I think only his second movie that he had composed music for and it was the first movie that I had music composed specifically for so um once again it's a, it's it's and it's our understanding of what music does for a movie it, it is not there to just hammer you over the head with what's already on screen or to make up deficits in emotion that you felt you you should have had and you didn't have it's to add a whole other level of d- discourse you know to a, a whole yeah. other element that would make it quite a different movie if you didn't have that music that's that's what we try to do and what do you think his work in in, in this film particular brings out in it well um it's um the music is basically it's it's based on Wagner's opera Siegfried, and uh, and that comes once again from within the movie. That you know, with Howard and I, we don't we don't sort of impose an abstract idea on a movie and kind of brand it and imprison it. We want the movie to tell us what it needs in terms of music, and it comes organically from inside the movie. And in this case, there is discussion between the main characters between Kira and and uh, Michael. Uh, about Wagner and about Siegfried and about the myth of the hero born out of sin and and and, and all of that and um, as I say those uh, those were not abstract ideas for Sabina Spielrein and Jung this this was these were real I mean she really basically wanted to have his baby and wanted it to be uh, Siegfried the 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 Wagnerian hero hero you know so this was this this was our key to the movie um, for the music and so 
it, it all comes out of that, and it, it, it's, it feels very Wagnerian. Uh, I've been flooded with emails to ask you, is, is there some plan you have to revisit The Fly? Um, I've actually written uh, a, a sort of, I guess you'd call it a kind of a sequel to The Fly, because Fox was kind of interested in that. Um, I don't know that they're interested in it enough to make it. <laughs> so I would be happy to do it. Uh, why don't you flood Fox with emails? Demanding? We will do that. <laughs> yeah, do that. Throughout the 26-year run of his hit show, Donahue, which set the benchmark for all daytime TV talk shows that followed, tens of millions of viewers were captivated by his insatiable curiosity, probing analysis, and deep compassion. As it turns out, these same qualities define him as a filmmaker as well. Phil Donahue co-directs and co-produces the new documentary, Body of War, which tells the devastating but ultimately inspiring story of Thomas Young, a 25-year-old patriot who was shot and rendered a paraplegic five days into his tour in Iraq. The film follows Thomas as he finds the strength to live within his compromised body and the voice to speak in opposition of the war. Mr. Donahue's collaborator on this project is Ellen Spiro, a tremendously gifted artist who has built a distinguished career by pushing the limits of the documentary art form. Her resume of breathtaking works include multi-award-winning films like Greetings from Out Here, Rome Sweet Home, and Troop 1500. Body of War, which is currently running in limited theatrical engagements and film festivals across the country, recently won the Best Documentary Prize from the National Board of Review. It is a tremendous pleasure to welcome these two great, talented, and passionate artists to Movie Geeks United, Mr. Phil Donahue and Miss Ellen Spiro. Uh, Mr. Donahue and Miss Spiro, are you with us? We are. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much for being with us tonight. It's a great honor to speak to you both. Uh, um, now, I, I saw Body of War uh, the other night, and uh, it, uh, it, it absolutely um, stunned me. It moved me to the core. And... Uh, and what I'm interested in is, Ellen, especially for you to, to come from the documentary f field, uh, you know, people talk about Hollywood's creative treatment of the war, and, the, you know, that's one thing. But I, I find that the documentary filmmakers are really the ones that are on the front line of this conflict, and, and, and they're, they're really producing some great work uh, about this war. Don't you agree? I do agree. Um, I think there's been a big black hole left by the media, and documentary filmmakers came in to fill it, and then the media started talking about how badly documentaries about Iraq were doing at the box office, and people stopped going. Well, in, in terms of why you chose, uh, because, Mr. Donahue, I, I realized that, I think I read a quote from you that said that you didn't want to just make another anti-war documentary, so... I'm wondering what idea first sparked the notion that you wanted to produce a film, and, and how do you see that this one differs from those that are already out there? Well, we do think we're different. Uh, when I first met this young man at Walter Reed uh, Army Medical Center, I just and learned about the gravity of his injury. He was very medicated at the time. Mm -hmm. So I met him a long time before he met me. And his mother told me about the nature of this injury. Thomas is a T4. What that means is his spine is severed between your shoulder blades. If you can, if you put your arm up above your shoulder and drop your hand down your back as far as you can go, that's where the bullet severed Thomas's spine. Yeah. Thomas is paralyzed from the nipples down. Thomas can't walk. And I, you know, 24 years old, he's lying there. He's very thin, his cheekbones. He's totally white. And I just felt that the people should see this. I believe this has been a, a very sanitized war and that uh, it may account for the reason that only 18% of us now think that the Iraq war is the most important thing. Uh, really, it's just a shame. I mean, these young people are coming home either dead and you can't take a picture of their coffins because the president said you couldn't and they all said okay, you know. And if you're going to send somebody, a nation to war, I think you have a responsibility to show the people the pain that many people are suffering because they answered the president's call. Thousands of people are going through what you see in our film, Body of War. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's 30,000 injured so far. And, it, you know, you multiply the people affected in your film by 30,000, and it's, it's, it's catastrophic. I mean, it's, it's unimaginable. Right. And, and the, 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 uh, the injuries in this war are especially hideous. Um, 
worse than, uh, you know, people are. We have blind people. Imagine, 20-something blind. Uh, oh, man, the more you, uh, the more you, yeah. the closer you get to Thomas, the the more you realize what a huge, huge sacrifice he has made. He's 28 years old, and he can't walk. And by the way, he went to war for a president who won't approve stem cell research. Yeah, really. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's fitting to note, uh, too, how he received his injury, where he received his injury, uh, that, fa- that, that bullet. Um, it was an unarmored uh, vehicle, wasn't it? Or- yes. It, it, he was in the back of a truck uh, with no top, Main right. Street, Sodder City, 25 guys jammed in there in the back. And they were really, they gave uh, fish in a barrel a new meaning. Yeah. I mean, they yeah. were just, and the bullet came down through his shoulder and somehow went through his body and severed his spine without hitting a major artery. Obviously, he wouldn't mm. have survived. And well, here I'm, we are. I'm interested in, in, in this because I definitely want to talk about Thomas. He's an extraordinary uh, man, uh, but your mentioning of the media uh, and the media's uh, reports on this war. We, we spoke to Brian De Palma months ago before the release of his film, and and his whole point his point was the same that during the Vietnam era we were we were flooded with photos that came in our living rooms of of, of the carnage and the devastation. What happened between then and now? Why the sanitation? Well, you know, I don't. My guess is that efforts to sanitize the war were underway in Vietnam too. But they weren't as sophisticated uh, as you have it today. Also, you know, I, I'm I'm not sure we had as compliant a press during Vietnam as we have now. Right. Um, you know, Halberstam and all that good reporting came reasonably early in the Vietnam War. It did. Uh, we haven't had much of that. Uh, We've had, now we learn the generals were in the tank. Imagine, they're getting yeah. briefed by Rumsfeld and running over to Fox, can't wait to end MSNBC and everybody else's CNN. I mean, this president took this nation by the ear and led us right into the sword. This is awful. Excuse me, Mr. Donahue, but didn't in 2003, wouldn't you have thought that listening to the generals on MSNBC and CNN that they were in the Pentagon's grip? I mean, it, it sounded that way, didn't it? Sure. That's why 77 senators voted aye, voted to approve the Iraq War resolution. But what was, and, and only 133 members of the House, what was happening is we had an administration that couldn't wait to bomb Saddam. Couldn't wait. And they didn't care whether the United Nations had finished its inspection. Right. They, it was they, a rush. They was wanted a, rush. a merry little war, and they thought they had one. The aircraft carrier stunt gives them away. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ellen, how, how did you come on board the, uh, the project? One day uh, I was sitting at home, and the phone rang, and it was uh, Phil Donahue on the other end, which, um, as, as you can imagine, Pretty surreal. Right. It, it is right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's still surreal now. Um, yeah, so so he, he told me this idea he had, and uh, I my immediate thought was that I wanted to meet Thomas because right. uh, Phil was, was so passionate about Thomas and his story, and he couldn't stop thinking about Thomas since, the day he met Thomas um, at Walter Reed Army Hospital. And so I said, well, you know, if, if it's a character-based documentary, we got to meet the characters. So we met in Kansas City, and Thomas was not the Thomas um, that you see towards the end of our film. He, he could barely form a sentence. Um, he was all drugged up, which is how the VA treated most of his injuries, was to prescribe lots of medications, including morphine. Um, But he did manage manage to crack me up. And uh, one of the things he he said that day was, you know, I was asking him just about his experiences, and and he said uh, soldiers voting for President Bush are like chickens voting for Colonel Sanders. (laughs) <laughs> um, and, I have a question you know, he, for the he, chat room. he never okay. he never let up. Whenever things get too serious, um, Thomas makes sure that everybody gets to laugh. 
Absolutely, yeah. He's remarkable. Uh, Jerry, you had a question from the yeah, chat room. Yeah, because we, were, we had gotten onto the, the topic of Thomas. Um, what is um, Thomas's view on his injury and his view of the war now? I don't, you know, that was one question I got um, regarding Thomas. Yes. I, I think he is adapting um, to his injury, which has been, I, I can't even imagine how challenging that is. Um, to suddenly at, at, you know, in your mid-20s, lose everything from your chest down and have to adapt. And our film shows, shows that process. Um, in addition to his consciousness evolving and he, him becoming this new person. You know, he came as close to death as a person can come, and he kind of comes back to life through our film and yeah. even more so now because he's, he's really doing some interesting things now, including um, having executive produced an album with Eddie Vedder, with 30 artists on it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he's writing for Billboard magazine, um, traveling around with rock stars. He's writing a book on his experiences too, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. that's going to come from a collection of the blog essays that he's doing for Billboard right. in, in addition to new material. So what what was his when you approached him and said expressed interest in making a film about about his struggles? Uh, what were his directions? What did he want from this film? Well, um, Thomas, at at certain points, he started telling me what to do, <laughs> 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 which you know kind of rubbed me the wrong way at first. And then I thought, wait, no, 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 wait a minute. You know, he he is the director of his own life, right? And he 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 has a part in the creative process. So he started coming up with ideas, and we would play around with them. And several of them are in the film. So I'm, I'm wondering how the co-directing uh, works. Uh, how were the were, were you? So are we. <laughs> We're wondering how this works. <clears throat> were, how, were you shooting most of the time, Ellen and and and, and Mr. Donahue? Were you were you seeing the footage and editing it, or how, how yes, did that divvy up? That's that's what happened, uh, and I was impressed immediately. I mean, it was really the material that she brought back was just. Um, she has such personal, um, emotional uh, quality to her work, and. The, um, <laughs> I mean, I there were so much, a lot she brought back. I mean, I just couldn't uh, keep it in. I couldn't talk and I couldn't see after a lot of yeah. this. And, we, you know, we're out there being honest. You know, this film will make you cry. But it will also make you laugh. And it will inspire you. You'll see a family coming up from the, you know, as big a hit. I mean, this is their firstborn son. And, and he's 28 now. And he can't walk. And his brother has <coughs> gone to, uh, his Excuse brother me. gets uh, deployed to Iraq in the middle of our film, and he's over there now. Which I find very interesting, because the, the family really is a, a, um, a microcosm of America, in a way. Uh, I mean, the, the, the father has a different viewpoint of the war than, than the mother and, and, and Thomas. Yeah. It's a red uh, and blue family. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, as a as a documentarian, what kind of presence do you have to be uh, uh, in the moment, Ellen, to to capture such kind of painful moments of intimacy? Um, you just have to be present, <laughs> just like you said, in the moment. So, yeah. you you have to kind of be ready and be there, but most of the time is not spent filming for the real intimate moments. Um, you know those. Some of those I, I shot alone, and then we had more public um, events in the film where, you know, Phil was very involved, and we had other camera people and sound people and lighting, and we have um, one wonderful scene that um, Bill Moyers actually opened his show about Body of War with the scene from the church where Thomas goes to speak, and it just so happens that the New York transit strike hit the day he's supposed to go do the speech. And um, Phil has taken one vehicle with uh, some of the camera 
people over to the church, and I'm in the other taxi cab with Thomas, right. and we're stuck in Manhattan, and we can't get uh, we can't get to the church on time. <laughs> and Ellen is in the right front seat of the taxi, right, and shoots one of the best scenes in our movie. I mean, the, the, I'll tell you, the girl spins silk, really, out of everything. It's, it, was, it was just one of the best scenes in our movie, and it's so impressive, you know, that she even thought to do this, that maybe this is something we can use, you know. I mean, I, most of the pe- I mean, a lot of camera people would be sitting on the camera around then and complaining about how long it took to get there. Right. And, but then again, the, the structure, it, it does move between Thomas' story and... The, the kind of the selling of the war and the process by which uh, the Senate voted for the war. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm wondering what inspired that kind of structure. Well, that was my idea. I have seen the, uh, the October 2003 Iraq War Resolution, and I was shocked. I couldn't get over it. It was essentially a superficial bumper sticker debate in which several of the members of the House and the Senate took the White House talking points and actually read them verbatim from the floor. A smoking gun can become a mushroom cloud. The fear campaign was underway by the White House. This is three weeks before an election. This is October 2002. You will recall the invasion was March of 2003. And what we see is senators literally... It's unbelievable the hysteria that this reached. Ted Stevens of Alaska in the middle of our film stands up on the floor of the Senate and says, history will show that the nations that stopped Saddam Hussein saved the world. Right. This is what they were saying. So, you know, it's, it's a study in how we got to this war that caused this young man to lose his ambulatory ability at, in his, when he was 24 years old. This is a terribly consequential vote, one of the most tragic votes. This is not an overstatement in the history of the Congress. I mean, my goodness, they, 100, only 133 members of the House. So we weave this throughout our film because, Thomas, without it, it's kind of a, oh, look at this lad, how sad. And Thomas didn't want that kind of film, and neither did I, neither did Ellen. We wanted to make a statement. Mm-hmm. Uh, and w- this this film speaks for the for Thomas and his mother, just to name two people, both of whom think that one more death in this war is morally indefensible. And we think that the uh, the uh, material from the Senate and the House floor is revealing in h- how shallow it was and how well orchestrated, and it's just the opposite of thoughtful. Well, it also it also delivers uh, another very heroic and inspirational figure into the film as well, and that's Senator Robert Byrd. Uh, I mean, he's he's one of twenty three senators to vote in opposition of the war. Right, uh, Robert Byrd, the longest serving member of the United States Senate in history, uh, stands in the middle of our film once again on the Senate floor and pleads with the American people to let this leadership know that you don't want this resolution jammed through this Congress before the election. The life of your son may depend upon it. The life of your daughter may depend upon it. I mean, this is October 2002. This is four months before the invasion, for God's sake. And they just dismissed him. He was patronized. He called attention to the fact that this was not a constitutional move, and it wasn't. Giving the president a resolution which says, here, if you have to, is not accommodating the mandate of the Constitution. Only Congress can declare war, and Congress hasn't done it since the early 40s because it doesn't want to. It's too dangerous. It's a third rail issue. And we, meanwhile, Senator Byrd, I, I believe he's the most tenured senator in, in, in history. Is that the history of the, of the Senate. No one yes. has served more. He passed Strom a couple of years ago. Some, something That's like right. 17,000 votes, and he even said that this is the most was the important most important vote, vote he'd ever cast. Yes, he did say that. And and the meeting between uh, Senator Byrd and Thomas at the end of uh, near the end of the film is just it's magical. I, I want to know who were both of you present for that meeting, and uh, if you could describe that moment for me. Well, we discussed this a long time. We had a we really had to work real hard to figure out how how do we mesh these two elements without confusing everybody and just 
you know, and I had been trying to get into Bird's office for a long time, really almost a year. And I finally got in, and what I did was show him choruses. That's all I showed him. I showed him choruses from the C-SPAN material. The, uh, you know, the it, Saddam is training Al-Qaeda in bomb making. He's training them to bomb make. He's this, you know, in the echo. And I showed him some of those. So he, he had a sense of what we were up to. And the next day we, we showed up with Thomas Young and filmed it. Oh, amazing. Uh, from a filmmaking standpoint, this is what I'm, I'm curious about. Because, Mr. Donahue, you've been in media for most of your life. And, and for you to just now enter the film medium, the, what surprised you about it? Oh, boy, a lot of things. I was a lamb in the woods in many ways. Ellen was a big help. I mean, really, Ellen, I don't know where. I'd still be wandering around in the woods. <laughs> uh, it really, it's very complicated. It's very expensive. Um, and there's just a lot of moving parts. You know, and that's why, you know, having Ellen on this was a big break, probably bigger than I. I have, I've been with a lot of camera people all my life. Right. And you can never use everything they shoot. And that, that's, that was the case with Ellen. I mean, everything she brought back was usable. Uh, but beyond that, beyond this technical ability, she, everything she brought back was really very creative. I mean, she's got a great eye. The girl is something. And so that was a break for me, for Mr. Amateur, you know, know-it-all. Uh, she survived, her, you know, being a co-director with me, you know, can you imagine? <laughs> and uh, here we are, you know, and we, you know, we're, we're just counting on our, uh, because we have been so well-received, you know. And, and by the way, the film's only 87 minutes long, you know. We'll have you to dinner by 9. It's not a rant. It's not a preachment. I'm not in it. We think that'll sell a couple of extra tickets. And uh, here you go. Um, uh, we, I wanted it to be 85 minutes because that's the length of the March of the Penguins. But I missed it by two. Oh, we're eight, we're, but we have longer credits. So. Right, right. <laughs> Absolutely. It, it is a fantastic film. And, and you, you say it's 87 minutes. Was, was, were there a lot, of, uh, a lot of footage left on the uh, oh, yes. floor that was painful to, to leave? Yes, yes. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Always painful to leave it behind. But um, I would imagine. Uh, so, everybody wanted it to move along and, and to, to be dynamic, and it does do that. So, Ms. Ms. Spira, I'm wondering how, uh, I know it's playing festivals across the country, it has been for quite some time now, and it, it, it has some limited theatrical runs, or, um, if you could we, tell me how our viewers might be able to, to, to yeah. find it near them. We, we've been in a lot of cities, um, and we continue to roll out in a lot more cities. I'm not sure when we're going to stop rolling out, maybe when this war comes to an end, um, right. but there's too many cities for me to, 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 to tell you. I could um, mention Chicago so, next week. Yes, Chicago um, next week, St. Louis, and uh, those are the two big ones coming up. But if you go to bodyofwar.com um, and click on Now Playing, you will see all the cities, festivals it's coming to. We're going to Honolulu, um, <laughs> if you have listeners there. But we're, we're really going all over the country, and we'll start going elsewhere soon. And fit, that's fantastic. And also, Body of War. There, there's a section there of, of your your website, bodyofwar.com. Uh, it's a page of things that we can do to make a difference. Uh, what, what kind of what kind of things will they find there? Well, there's there's 12 things, and they all link you to organizations that have been working um, for various efforts connected to the war. Some working for veterans. Um, some you know, working explicitly to bring the troops home. But all the issues are, are covered and all the organizations like the Iraq Veterans Against the War and Military Families Speak Out are linked. So if you go to the Take Action section of bodyofwar.com, you can see what all those things are. Okay, great. Do you mind if we take a caller before we close up uh, tonight? Not at all. Okay. Uh, we have a 623 area code. 623, go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. 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 Um, to feel which candidate running for president do you think will affect the war if elected? Will affect the war how? If, if elected, he, positive if, or negative. I see. Well, certainly I will vote for the Democrat, whoever she, he may be. Um, I certainly believe that... Uh, 
the next president is just going to have to get out. What's just heartbreaking is that we have to wait for a change in administration for this to happen. Yeah. That's you know that's a political decision, right? And it's and we have more people coming home, dead, and grievously injured in this war for what? I mean, can you imagine those two uniformed officers coming up your front porch today? Mothers look out the window and they faint. Oh. This is going. This is what is happening for this war against a country that had none of this stuff, that didn't attack us on 9-11, repeat, did not have anything to do with 9-11? Yeah. Um, excuse Jerry, me. Jerry, go ahead. I have a question from uh, Daniel Moon in the chat room, and he would like to know where the profits from the film are going. Well, as I announced early on, uh, I will accept no profits from this film. Thomas has already... Uh, Ellen talked about his uh, album a little bit ago, and mentioned that uh, Ellen, the Sire Records uh, deal. Right. Yeah. Um, well, Sire Records um, put out an album that Thomas Young curated, also called Body of War, um, and they offered Thomas a hundred thousand um, dollars. And Thomas, being Thomas, didn't take it and uh, said that he wanted all the money to go to the Iraq veterans against the war right um so and then profits from our film should there be any uh would go to thomas okay fantastic uh one more caller i, th I believe this is our our uh, dvd correspondent actually aaron uh aaron is this you did you have a question i do have a question uh go ahead hello uh hello mr donahue mr. hi Aaron. hi how you doing I, I have a question mr donahue just to broaden kind of this political spectrum just a little uh, and also to tie in with a little bit i guess if you don't mind the word, your legacy, in that, you know, yes, this is your first film, but obviously ever since, you know, beginning of your show, you've been dealing with political issues. Uh, my father was an air traffic controller up till 81, and I remember him telling me stories when you had the controllers on on, uh, on your show back in that, around that time during the strike, and you were one of the few outlets who were actually supporting the, the, the strike, which was a big deal. And I'm curious of but I'm all about film preservation and, and preservation of history. I'm curious if, if you had any thought of doing something similar to what Charlie Rose has done, of putting your, your shows online. And that well, was thank you for that suggestion. I remember the Patco story very well. And it's still relevant to this day, even with yeah. American Airlines. Uh, yeah. People may not think, you know, people may not even remember the air traffic controller strike, but the this recent American Airlines fiasco is is totally tied in to, can be traced back all the way to the Patco thing. Uh, you mean the maintenance fiasco? Yeah, all this maintenance, I mean, I can, this was stuff that the yeah. unions were, were telling people right. a long time ago. What I remember about Patco was the arrogance and the dismissal, the dismissing behavior of Reagan. Reagan came down from on high and put his jackboot right on the neck of Patco. And it, he really isolated them, you know. And I thought it was a sneak attack, and labor was on its back anyway. And, you know, I, I never crossed a picket line myself. If you think I'm bragging, I am. Uh, so I remember those uh, days very much. Uh, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure your question was. His question was about uh, concerning your, your personal legacy of, of shows. Do you, are there oh, well, they, yeah. Uh, Universal owns the library, and, and I will have uh, conversations with them sometime soon about what we might do with this. For example, I don't think our library is digitalized, or is it digitized? Um, and, uh, you know, that's just the first step that has to be done. So we'll see. It's very expensive, and we have probably 3,000 shows out there. It's an incredible body of work you have. Uh, we're going to take one more call, and then we're going to close out. Uh, you guys have been so generous to us. Uh, we have a 702 area code. Go right ahead. Actually, I'm going to go ahead. Um, I think the room has said that they wanted to get this Daniel character on with them. So I believe um, I'm going to go ahead and let him have the last question there, Jamie. Okay, Mark, okay. go ahead. Is he on your line? Um, he's not on the line. Um, he should be um, on. The, he should be on you guys' line, but not on my line. <laughs> okay, well that's fine. I, I don't want to. I don't want to spend any any more of our guest time. But, but thank you so much. 
Mr. Donahue and, and Ms. Spiro, uh, I, I admire your work so much, and I appreciate you being on with us so much tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We're pleased to be here, and we'd like to say that we do have a website, bodyofwar.com, and we open Chicago next Wednesday. Uh, Marvin Hamlish, what can you say about Marvin Hamlish? He, he, these are the awards that he's won. He's won an Emmy, he's won a Grammy, an Oscar, a Tony, a Pulitzer Prize uh, for his work uh, for A Chorus Line, mm -hmm. the Broadway show A Chorus Line, just songs that will live forever. Right. And also he's won a Golden Globe, and he's up for another Golden Globe Sunday night for his new score for The Informant, which is easily one of the most unique, fun, and infectious scores that we've had in, in years. Mm -hmm. uh, and as we discussed in this interview, just perfectly mirrors the... Uh, the the journey that that character takes. Um, he's an amazing composer. He conducts very prestigious uh, orchestras uh, across the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know credits like uh, the way we were. Uh, another song that will live forever. Uh, yeah. The, the the early comedies of Woody Allen. Uh, the Sting. He made The Entertainer a great hit. Mm -hmm. uh, Ordinary People. Sophie's Choice. On and on and on. Uh, so it was a tremendous pleasure for both of us to uh, to chat with him. And here is Marvin Hamlish talking about his great career, his feelings about film composition, and his new score for the Inform. This new score for the Informant is incredible. And, but this is your first, if I'm not mistaken, your first feature film score in many years. Uh, yeah, probably ten years. Yeah. Was that a kind of a self-imposed hiatus from film scoring, or? Uh, yeah, a little bit, yes. And uh, I was very busy on other projects and things. And um, I was just so uh, flattered when uh, I got a call from Steven Soderbergh that there was no way for me to say no to someone like that. And yeah. so it was a, a, it was a I, wonderful experience. Uh, did you respond to it right away, the, the material? What kind of drew you to it? No, I didn't respond right away, actually. What happened was that... Um, uh, after I saw the film, and I uh, saw it a couple of times, and we, he and I, of course, spoke, and one of the things he told me was that it was very important that um, he wanted everyone in the audience to know this is funny, this is a comedy, you know, don't uh, don't take it too seriously. And uh, it took a while to figure out the approach to this to this film. Mm -hmm. um, and finally what happened was about two weeks after I saw it, and I was working on it, even though I hadn't written a note, uh, it dawned on me that if a person is bipolar, mm -hmm. as this protagonist is, that would mean that what he shows to the world, you know, the, the, the vibes he gives out to the world are not, uh, you know, how should I say, are not the ones that he actually feels, because mm -hmm. he's seen things, uh, you know, topsy turvy, and that's when I got the idea of really doing everything opposite. So. Uh, I, I give him a happy-go-lucky theme, even though he's not happy-go-lucky. Um, if, if he supposedly is a, a good guy, then the bad guys are the FBI. I mean, everything became totally the other way. I mean, the score itself almost acts as the brain that he has and the way he's thinking in his mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can definitely hear that in the score, and, yeah. and I un understand that the, the bipolar aspect of that character played an important role, as you just said, right, in, right. in crafting the score. What's interesting to me as a film composer, um, you you are an interpreter of of the film and of the characters in the film that, that are represented by your music, uh, but you came in when this film was already put together. Is that I ideal for you, or would you prefer to come in during the script phase or the pre-production no, phase? No, 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 that's, that's perfectly ideal. That's perfectly ideal. I mean... I think a lot of people have the notion that somehow the music is done first or something like that. It doesn't work like that. It works that the film is first made, which is I think right. I mean, you gotta it's gotta be on the film. You've gotta have your you've gotta have your story, you've gotta have your film, you've gotta have something that says this is what this is. And at that point I come in uh and look at the film and then start to slowly but surely, you know, get ideas. And of course if you're working with a very strong director Particularly the director who knows what he wants, it's very helpful. Right. Mm -hmm. And you work with great directors, and including Soderbergh, of course. But right. 
what is what is that relationship you're you're looking for? What is the ideal for you, director composer yeah, relationship? The ideal is that the uh, 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 director kind of tells you in big. Um, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be in minutia. It doesn't have to be in little every little thing of the film. But he tells you generally what he's looking for, and as you go scene after scene, he kind of gives you a feeling of what he feels would be right. Now, that just helps because at least you're trying to get on the same page, mm-hmm. and that's very important. Um, and in the in the comedy, you have to be very very careful because you don't want to in any way hurt the laugh. You want to enhance everything. You want to make sure that you're heightening emotions, not in any way uh, stifling them. Um, so that's that's what we that's what you really look for. Well, all the composers that we interview, we've we've welcomed many many composers on the show, and a running theme seems to be that that comedy seems to be the trickiest of all the genres to to score for. Do you find that that's the case? Right. That is true, and I'll tell you how you know that. Many times a director, particularly with a comedy, will preview either certain scenes or the whole picture, uh, and you'll know where the laughs are. You, you, you'll know because you'll be there. You'll hear the audience laugh. Now you put in your music. Now, if they don't laugh as much in a specific scene that has music, it means your music has done something to hurt that laugh, mm-hmm. and that is dangerous. Mm-hmm. You've got to be very, very careful in uh, music. One of the things that I've always found with a laugh in a film is not just what kind of music it is, but where you put the music. Uh, sometimes you can put the music in the wrong place and stop a laugh from happening. Uh, so you have to, it's, yes, it is a it's the trickiest uh, type of, 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 of scoring I think that, that you that you get. I would think that the I'm I'm not quite sure if you did this on this film or not, but kind of the, the screening process would be important for a comedy then to gauge the reaction. Absolutely, to the music. absolutely, yeah, yeah. No, no question. It's a very important because you, you, you get a sense of what the audience is actually, you know, what they're actually feeling. I mean, it's, 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 in comedy, it's, it's, the one good thing is an audience pretty well tells you uh, if it's funny or not because, you know, you're going to hear laughter very different than in an adventure film or in a, in a uh, love story. In a love story, you're hoping that people are crying at the end. In a mm-hmm. comedy, you are almost able to tell scene by scene how you're doing and if the laughs are scoring. Yeah. Yeah, I was um, just um, curious of the informant, though. It's such a, um, like you want to say, a brave comedy because for the first half, you're not really sure um, about the character. And I think right. there's, there's a light switch goes on the second half where you realize that this he is like almost like a really demented version of Don Quixote. I mean, this guy's really um, delusional. And I think your score perfectly complements that. I mean, definitely um, evokes that for the whole film, but especially in the well, second half. Well, thank you very much. In fact, you know, I met the man, the actual man. He's still alive and actually doing very well. He uh, came out of prison. He got on his medication. He uh, built his life. Uh, I met him and his wife, and uh, he was very happy with the film. He really was, and he said that uh, he thought that the score was very strong in terms of the way he was feeling. So I was very happy to to meet him and know that he came through all this, you know? Yeah, wow. yeah. Now, you kind of fell into film scoring by sheer chance, if I read correctly. Right. It, it was never right. really a consideration of yours, right? It wasn't It it wasn't. It wasn't the first thing that I wanted to do. I, I was a kid in New York City, and I loved... Uh, Broadway, and what I, all I wanted to do was write a Broadway show, but no one was handing me anything to do, and uh, I was the rehearsal pianist on a show called The Funny Girl with Barbara Streisand, and I got a phone call from someone one night asking me to play at a party, uh, and the party turned out to be for the producer, Sam Spiegel, uh, and he had just produced On the Waterfront and Lawrence of Arabia. Mm-hmm. And I went over to play this party, and out of this party, I got my first uh, film score. And that was The Swimmer. Right. Right, right. And, Jerry, you won yeah, that. Yeah, a couple. This is like one of those, I think one of the first and one of the best of the 
movies about suburbia, um, and I and I love the the music for it. But I wanted to really know: Did you ever get to meet John Cheever, who wrote the story that it's based on? No, I did not. Okay, I, did I was not. just curious because it's a fascinating, right. fascinating character of the 20th century. Um, and right, it's, yes. And that the swimmer is just devastating. The last um, 15 minutes. Um, where Lancaster's running and everything, and the music is, is just, oh, it's a heartbreaking film. Um, the watch, heartbreaking, I think is the right word. And I just was one of my favorite films. Um, it's just a great film. Yeah, it, 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 is a, it is a wonderful film. I think it may have been quite ahead of its time yeah, um, it was. when it came out. And I, I, I think it would be nice to see someone re release that one of these days because it is, as you say, uh, something that really. Uh, captures that whole world of uh, suburbia, and uh, it was a very unique uh, film at the time. Now you've you've done conducting, uh, you, you, you've you've written for Broadway, and <clears throat> on and on, so many accomplishments. But is there something uniquely satisfying about film scoring for you, or, or is it all part of the same fabric? Uh, no, there is something. Uh, there is something uh, uh, very rewarding because, you know, when you do a film score, sometimes, not everyone, but sometimes because you are writing and there's a story out there, you're asked to write something that normally you wouldn't write. You know what I mean? Normally you'd be sitting at the piano and you, you might be writing a song, you might be, uh, you know, writing a song for a, for a Broadway show, but you wouldn't be writing, quote, background music in a film that takes place in, you know, 1924, uh, you know, Hungary or whatever. So what's what what's kind of exciting in film scores is that you tend to do very many different types of music, and uh, I like that challenge. I enjoy that. That keeps me not just writing the way I normally would write, but kind of making me write uh, differently than I would normally do. Yeah. I want to ask you about the – if film scoring has has changed over the years or the role of the film composer has changed, I, I'm not sure if you're aware of this article that was written in Variety several weeks ago uh, that, that talked about uh, the, the, the luster of the film composer, wh where it used to be right up there with, with editor. Uh, it seems to be relegated to, to, sound of, to the realm of sound effects more and more. There's yeah, I less... Think... I, I think there's been a trend that I don't think is a good trend, and I'm hoping it changes. I think there's been a trend to use music almost like to, the way they use sound effects. Mm -hmm. It almost becomes a kind of electronic um, background. Um, and because of the use of electronic instruments now and all this stuff, music can now give you a lot of different sounds. And I think that directors, for some reason, which I don't understand why, uh, shy away from the kind of thing that I like to do, which is to actually write themes for these films and right. to have, you know, things that come back and uh, that you connect uh, the dots, so to speak, with themes. And um, I'm not sure why that's happened uh, exactly. It, it might be because... What? It seems self-destructive for a film because the music right. the music is the heart and soul of the film. The music and the editing is really, I think, where the film really comes together. And if you don't have a good score or a good, uh, you, know, you really are, your film is going to hurt because that's the first thing that, well, at least for me, watching movies all my life, is the, is the score of the music is vital. Mm -hmm. it, makes, right. it makes all the difference. Well, I agree with you, but I will say that there are directors right now who don't want that and they just want music to almost like just fill in some some noise and uh, I think I think that's a, that is a problem however I think it's because with electronics we've got a new toy that has just arrived and uh, we're still playing with it as it's, as it's being a toy as opposed to it really making music uh, I think slowly but surely we're gonna go the, the pendulum is going to swing back to where it was uh, and I think you're going to get more uh, classical Well, I think it's a, it might be a cultural thing because you hear it when you turn on the radio, too. You, there, there are no melodies out there anymore. <laughs> exactly, uh, right. No, yeah, you're right. True. That's true. Where do the melodies go? I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I, when I was growing up, I liked rock and roll. I really did. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
But I must say that when I'm listening to radio and you hear music from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, you hear a lot of melodies. You do hear a lot of uh, songs, rock and roll tunes, but with melodies. And then you hit upon today's world, and you just wonder where did that, again, where did it go, and why is it gone? Uh, but my sense is it will be back. Um, another movie from this year that is one of my absolute favorites is, is Every Little Step. And uh, that, of course, chronicles the beginnings of, uh, of a chorus line and, and mirrors that with modern-day auditions for a revival. Uh, tell me about that experience and, and working with, with Michael Bennett and everyone involved in that. Did that feel like a groundbreaking uh, project at the time? Well, what it felt like, which was really fantastic, was that all of the people working on that show uh, – not, not, of course, counting Michael, had never done a show before. And so we didn't know, we didn't, we didn't understand quite all of the um, uh, pressure on, on people to write a show. All we were trying to do was write something totally new and different and uh, see if we couldn't write something that was really, you know, uh, special. But... The whole workshop process made it possible for us to really hone our craft. And so it was a very exciting time in my life. And I just knew that I was in the hands of someone that really knew what he was doing, which was Michael. And I felt very secure about writing the show. Mm -hmm. your, uh, that, that's where your Pulitzer, that's where you won your Pulitzer from, that piece. Right. The, the Pulitzer was given out to the creators of uh, A Course Line, yes. Wow. Has has Broadway changed? I, I, I hear a lot about uh, it's a little depressing, the, the changing face of Broadway from, from the good old days there. Well, the, the, the interesting thing that's happening on Broadway, which is really interesting, is that it's making a fortune. I mean, mm -hmm. the, and because it's making a fortune, um, it, it almost is uh, – it, 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 there's a huge contradiction on Broadway. There hasn't been a song that you can remember on uh, Broadway for a long time. So the scores are kind of like, uh, you know, either through composed, you know, where it's very much every everything that they say is sung, and the songs themselves are just okay. But what's happened is the book of a musical has become so important that if a musical has a really strong book, then it almost doesn't matter what the music and lyrics are like because the show's going to run. Um, this is all different than years ago when it used to be boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl, but you could certainly hum all the songs. Uh, you know, we've, we've gone through a change there. Again, I think, I could be wrong, but I think the pendulum is going to swing, and all we're waiting for is one show to bust out with a couple of really great songs, and things will start to, uh, to change again. It seems that people are... Uh are just hungry for the the familiar. So so the big successes are the the big star uh, led revivals and things. Um, is the problem and, and uh, is probably going to get crucified for this, but is the problem these musicals based on these movies that have this trend that's been going on the last like fifteen? Years? Well, the thing is this: the the, the thing is this that uh, it's very hard to find an original musical. Right. It's very hard to find. And producers who are making all this money are saying to themselves, you know, there is a, there is an advantage to either bringing a show in from London, bringing in a re revival, bringing in a show based on a movie because people know the title. Right. And right. you're right. That has that that has a significant uh, value. Um, I, I must tell you truthfully, I too am in that in that uh, predicament, and the show that I'm working on is uh, a show that's based on an old movie, uh, which is uh, The Nutty Professor, which is a Jerry mm -hmm. Lewis film. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the uh, only thing I can say to you is, when it comes to revivals, the only thing that bothers me about revivals is sometimes they revive them way too early. Way too early. Right, right. Uh, I mean, something that closed 10 years ago, I don't think warrants a revival, you know. Uh, but... But that's what's happening. And, again, the reason you can't really get too ex upset about this is because the producers are making a fortune. Right. So 
if they're making a fortune, they, they don't want to pretty well change the formula because it's working. True. You know? that's, that's what people want to see. So give them what they want. Give them what they want. Yeah, of course. True. Exactly. Exactly. Now you've you've won every award in your profession under the sun the the Emmy and the and the Grammy and the Oscar and the Tony and Pulitzer and you're up for a Golden Globe uh, this upcoming Sunday. Uh, right. Do you does it still feel uh, special for you or are you still nervous about it? How are you feeling about it? Uh, let me tell you, I think that any time you get a nomination, it's a, it's a big deal. Uh, because, you know, when you sit down and write a score, you don't sit down going, it's not like, like if you were in a race. Let's say you, you knew that next Sunday you, you were going to be in a race. Well, a race means someone wants, is going to win, someone's going to lose, and you're trying to win. This has nothing to do with awards. Awards are uh, after the fact, meaning you do your work and you try to make it as good as you can, and then all of a sudden this other thing happens, which is, you get picked in, uh, and, and you have this artificial race. So I'm not too excited. I'm actually very happy about getting a nominated. That I was really thrilled with. But I'm very um, very glad just to be going to the Golden Globes. And, yes, I'd be thrilled to win. Don't get me wrong. It would be thrilling. Uh, it's not not, you know. Uh, uh, having, won, having won before, I guess, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for anything. But... Um, it, it, it is exciting to be part of that game, I must say. And I think this year, movie-wise, I think there have been some fantastic movies. So uh, yes, I, think it's been a very, I think this has been a really banner year for movies. Also, you know, there's a lot of composers. Have you noticed uh, in the last couple of years how many new names there are for yes. as, composers as opposed to 20 years ago where it was down to five or six people doing everything, you know? Yeah, that's true. It's, it's kind of amazing. Mm-hmm. And, and it very much is. I think a lot of it speaks to the, the kind of electronic age that you're talking about, too, because it, in the independent movement, it seems easier for – it seems like a more open field. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It really is. It really is. Well, Mr. Mr. Hamlish, I could talk to you all day. Uh, I had so many questions for you, but a tremendous honor for both of us to yes, speak to well, you. Well, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. 